Understanding creation, where did life come from? Uh, it's an interesting title. Uh, one of the things they say in English is you never use a preposition to end a sentence with. So, uh, but uh, it's a colloquial form. Uh, we've been studying the book Understanding Creation. Um, it was edited by James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. For those of you who haven't been here before, we've been going through 20 chapters, which are questions that are meant to be standalone, although they occasionally reference each other. And uh, uh, the authors were given a fairly tight leash, uh, and it will show today because when we go through this, uh, 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 we won't see all of the possible arguments there are uh, concerning the origin of life. Um, and this week, the chapter we're talking about is Where Did Life Come from? It, from? And it was written by George Yavor. For those of you who don't know, George Yavor used to teach here. He is kind of Professor Emeritus. He's now in, I think, North Dakota, one of the Dakotas. He uh, uh, received his Bachelor in Chemistry from Brown University and a PhD in Biochemistry from Columbia University. Uh, interestingly enough, those are both considered Ivy League schools. He did some postdoctoral research in Rockefeller University and then joined the chemistry department at Andrews and came down here to teach biochemistry, uh, pardon me, bio microbiology. Uh, most of his work has been done on Escherichia coli. That's the common coliform bacterium, lives in your gut. He's published several articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals and also in denominational publications and has written three books. And he'll reference one of them at the very end. Uh, George Javor has in some ways the easiest question to answer. Uh, the, the origin of life is one which those who wish to exclude a creator from uh, uh, the universe have the most difficult time. Uh, George makes a good case. First, he'll outline his case, as we'll see, and then he'll go into more detail. Uh, and he shows that life does indeed require a creator. He remarks on and draws conclusions from something about life that is um, often overlooked, and that is namely that life is not in equilibrium. A fairly simple concept, but uh, a profound one. George uh, starts out, life is the most important phenomenon on Earth. The biosphere of millions of different kinds of organisms, so extensive that there is not a square inch of sterile surface anywhere on Earth. Well, maybe uh, the immediate surface of a volcano that is just erupted might be one, but it rapidly gets contaminated. Um, <coughs> makes this the planet pulsate with many faceted manifestations of life. But we are, on Earth, a striking singularity in our cosmic neighborhood. After decades of diligent search for life in the solar system, which contains about 150 planets and moons, it is clear that we are alone here. Uh, Dr. Yavor is saying this after having watched much of the history, which he will now relate. The question of how life originated on Earth is one of the most perplexing pu uh, puzzles of contemporary science for the following reasons. One, the works of Reedy, uh, Spallanzani, Pasteur, and others conclusively discredited the concept that living matter may spontaneously arise from non-living matter. Two, the immense isolation of the solar system from other heavenly bodies renders the concept of life being imported from elsewhere in the universe to be beyond the realm of plausibility. Uh, the nearest th star, it takes light itself for years to get here. Trying to imagine something that would get here from there without being destroyed by cosmic rays on the way through is uh, uh, a little difficult. 
Three, laboratory experiments to generate life from non-living matter in the past 50 years have not only been utterly unsuccessful, but show little promise to ever succeed. Uh, four, scientists cannot restore dead organisms to life. A simple but profound uh, concept. And five, analysis of the essence of life reveals that it could not have originated spontaneously anywhere in the universe. And here he'll be talking about the essence of life, which involves irreducible complexity, but goes beyond that. And he will now define life. Uh, in this discussion, life refers to the complex behavior of cells, the fundamental units of living matter. Thus, life is not an abstract entity, but the consequences of thousands of coordinated biochemical processes within the cell. In multicellular beings, living cells constitute living tissues and organs which are in turn part of living organisms. The life of a cell is a qualitatively different term than the life of a tissue, an organ, or an organism, though they are re related to each other hierarchically. That is, living organisms depend on their living organs and tissues, which in turn depend on their living cells. In this sense, the term life has multiple meanings. So he will say that there's life and then there's life, um, but you can't have organismic life without cellular life. What follows is a more detailed consideration of the five points above. And that's, so he's not going to fill in all the, all the details, or not all of them, but a good share of them and leave you with some reading to fill in the rest of them. The surprising conclusion will be that the only logical answer to life's origin can be found not in the latest science journals, but in records penned some 3,500 years ago, long before the advent of modern science. He's giving you his conclusion at the beginning. First, he talks about the spontaneous generation of life and points out that it's been around for a long time as an idea and, for example, it gives a formula intended to produce mice. You put a bunch of stuff in, a, in an open bottle, wait 21 days, and there will be mice. Well, of course, the mice could have migrated in. Um, and why somebody didn't think to check that is, is kind of surprises me a little bit. Um, it was thought that the mud on pond bottoms produced frogs and snakes. And rotten meat supposedly gave rise to maggots. And you know, I think in this context, it's a little more understandable that people like Haeckel would say that they found protoplasm at the bottom of uh, uh, a lake. In 1668, Francisco Redi, an Italian physician, um, covered a jar of rotten meat with a fine Naples veil, thus preventing the appearance of maggots. Actually, as I understand it, the maggots did appear. They just appeared on top of the veil where the flies laid their eggs. Um, so this was one of the big arguments against, well, rotten meat doesn't really produce maggots. It takes something to lay eggs and then produce maggots, um, and presumably flies. However, there were those who wouldn't let it go so easily, and so John Needham said, well, yeah, but that was just uh, visible life. We're talking about microorganisms, and they could happen spontaneously. So he took a flask and boiled it, killed all the germs, let it stand open to the air, and sure enough, the flask, after a few days, turned cloudy. This is then to demonstrate the spontaneous appearance of microorganisms in broth, which had been sterilized. Um, the answer came by another Italian physician, Lazzaro Spallanzani, who repeated Needham's experiment with, except that he sealed the opening to the flask. And the broth stayed clear and stayed clear and stayed clear, and then finally they opened it up, and sure enough, at that point, the broth became cloudy. Well, so there's something about the air that does this. 
And uh, finally, in 1859, the French chemist Louis Pasteur repeated Spallanzani's experiment, except that he stored the boiled broth in flasks with open necks, but that bent down so that anything that was floating in the air would not tend to float up into them. And um, the broth stayed clear, so obviously if air could get to it, but not these particular whatever that was, and probably microorganisms. You know, and uh, then if you break the neck, uh, the broth could grow organisms just fine. And Pasteur's work effectively put an end to the concept of the spontaneous generation of life. It didn't even work for microorganisms. Those came from floating microorganisms. Curiously, also in 1859, Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species was published. Although the treatise doesn't deal with the question of how the first living organism came to existence, the theory of evolution strongly implies it implied the proce uh, process of abiogenesis. And Darwin recognized that himself, although in, the, in his book he ends with a few, one or a few kinds that were started by the creator. Um, in his letters, he suggests a warm little pond with ammonium and phosphoric salts. Um, and if you're getting God out of the business of working with life, why have God start life in the first place? Since Pasteur's work apparently closed the door on the concept of natural abiogenesis, alternative possibilities were then considered in order to account for the appearance of life on Earth. And one such concept proposed in the early 20th century was panspermia, <coughs> the notion that life came from, Earth, from elsewhere in the universe in the form of spores. And he mentions eminent uh, Swedish physical chemist Vante Arrhenius as one of the early proponents of this theory. I might add that uh, both uh, uh, Fred Hoyle of the Boeing 747 uh, being made out of, a, uh, out of a junkyard by a tornado fame and the one who said that there's some intellect that monkeyed with the physics of the universe. Um, and uh, also, interestingly enough, Francis uh, Crick of uh, Crick and Watson famed the DNA double helix. Um, were uh, also proponents of span uh, panspermia. So where did all that life come from? Well, they searched for life in space, and uh, panspermia can only occur if there's a source of living organism somewhere. Preferably in the solar system, because it doesn't take as much time to transport them. And they're not as susceptible to cosmic rays along the way and so forth. Um, a promising candidate for life source was Mars, our planetary neighbor, a mere 36 million miles away at its closest approach. And it's now believed uh, fairly strongly that we have meteorites that got blasted off of Mars that have landed on the Earth. So you could, you know, kind of buy that if you needed to. With temperatures as warm as 20 degrees centigrade, or 7 degrees Fahrenheit, in an atmosphere consisting largely of carbon dioxide. Of course, that's not what it usually is. It's usually below freezing, but, uh, but it's, uh, it can get that warm. It was envisioned that anaerobic microorganisms, uh, extremophiles, organisms that like extremes of temperature and so forth, and uh, perhaps uh, anaer anaerobic didn't need oxygen, might exist there, provided that there's some water in the soil. In 1976, two fully equipped robotic laboratories landed on Mars as part of the billion dollar Viking missions. Um, keep this in perspective, we had just been to the moon about eight years uh, before. The experiments conducted in Martian soil yielded shocking results. Not only was there no trace of life on Mars, but not a single organic molecule could be found on the red planet. And he has a reference for that. Um, other candidates, the, by the way, there's some odd catalysis uh, being, uh, taking place uh, by some of the rocks, uh, which fooled people for a while. But it's pretty much generally conceded that they did not find either life or organic molecules at this time. 
Other candidates for life so source in the solar system include Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, believed to uh, possess a subsurface ocean underneath its icy crust, warmed apparently by gravitational interaction with the planet Jupiter, um, as well as Titan, one of Saturn's moon moons, which is covered with an extensive atmosphere of nitrogen, one of the few places that you could find an atmosphere that was semi-conducive to life. Um, however, they haven't found any uh, life on either planet, or either moon, I should say. And having no further data at this time, uh, we can assert that we are alone in the solar system, to uh, the best of our knowledge. And certainly the idea that something came out of Titan and got to Earth, uh, in spite of no evidence of life on Titan, is, is stretching the, the subject. Traveling from the sun at the speed of light, four and a half hours gets us to the outer reaches of the solar system. At this point, we must continue for 4.3 years before reaching the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, which is 25 trillion miles away. Thus, we find that Earth is at the center of an imaginary sphere that has a radius of 25 trillion miles, totally devoid of life. This eliminates the remotest likelihood of panspermia. If panspermia is impossible, the only alternative for evolution is abiogenesis on Earth. Um, A.I. Operin wrote, um, by his experiments, Pasteur demonstrated beyond peradventure of doubt the impossibility of auto-generation of life in the sense as it was imagined by his predecessors. Namely, the, you know, put the corn husks in the corner and you get mice. He showed that living organisms couldn't be formed suddenly before our eyes from formless solutions and infusions. A careful survey of the experimental evidence, however, tells us nothing about the impossibility of generation of life at some other epoch or under some other conditions. And that, I put the wrong note number, sorry. Um, on the one hand, such reasoning downplays the significance of experimentally proven facts. It's just fascinating that he's taking, uh, he's taking theory over fact. Um, on the other hand, it elevates hypothetical suppositions of what could have happened in a different epoch. Thus, in spite of knowing that spontaneous generation of life was an impossibility, in the 1920s, British biologist J.B.S. Haldane and Russian chemist A.I. Operin proposed that life on Earth probably originated in a primordial ocean where the atmosphere did not contain oxygen. And this was uh, standard theory about 1950s or so. Um, <coughs> to be fair to them, in 1920s, biochemistry was in its, still in its infancy. Due to lack of information, no one comprehended the enormous complexity of living matter. The first enzyme crystal made of pure protein was only obtained in 1926. The citric acid cycle was discovered in 1937. The general structure of genetic material, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, became known in 1953. Molecular biology came onto the scene in the 1960s, and it was 1997 when Dolly the sheep was cloned. Uh, therefore, Haldane and Operin may be excused when they imagine that some of the simple protoplasmic blobs, precursors of today's organisms, could by chance come into existence in an imagined primordial world. Uh, our knowledge of the structure of life is much, much greater than theirs was back then. Chemical evolution as a scientific discipline began in 1953, same year that DNA was um, figured out. When Stanley Miller, a graduate student at the University of Chicago, set about to test Oprin's hypothesis in the laboratory, he circulated the, the atmosphere that was supposed to have been there, um, water vapor, methane, and ammonia, in a closed glass apparatus, and then exposed it to electrical discharges, sparks. After a week, this procedure yielded four amino acids and numerous other organic compounds. Uh, the uh, most uh, prevalent one was hydrogen cyanide, interestingly enough, um, which is true of almost all of these experiments, but you don't read that very often. 
Soon many variations of the Miller experiment were performed in numerous laboratories producing most of the 20 amino acids. Four nucleobases, I would say that's stretching it just a little bit. If you add extra stuff to it, you can, you can do that. And sugars and fatty acids, which are the building blocks of the important biological polymers. By the 1970s, eagerness to discover the genesis of life on Earth reached its gen zenith. And this is about the time that I think the origin of life really made its way into biology textbooks because they thought they were almost there. Uh, well, actually, if you have any oxygen at all, it kills the process. And if you have a quasi, uh, if you don't have a strongly reducing atmosphere, you have to have hydrogen or ammonia or something like that that's got a, l a lot of reducing power. If you do it with, for example, carbon dioxide and, uh, and nitrogen and water vapor, you won't get anywhere near the kinds of uh, uh, compounds that you will otherwise. So that's a problem. Um, in 1974, and this is you know, just before they sent the rovers to Mars and everybody's excited and we're going to find this stuff. We are confident that the uh, basic process of chemical evolution is correct. So confident that it seems inevitable that a similar process has taken place in many other planets of the solar system. This is before they'd gotten out to explore it. We are sufficiently confident of our idea about the origin of life that in 1976, a spacecraft will be sent to Mars to land on the surface with the primary purpose of the experiments being a search for living organisms. And for some reason, which I don't understand, it uh, lists this as S.I. Miller. I'm sure it's uh, S.L. Miller. Um, the negative outcome of those experiments has been already described above. Proteins, the most vital components of cells. They do the most jobs are composed of strings of hundreds of amino acid residues in specific order. It basically explains about you, amino acids taking out water in order to link them together and what you have left is called the residue. How amino acids may polymerize into proteins in aqueous medium in putative primordial settings is yet to be solved. <laughs> he doesn't actually. Uh, well, as I, as I said, having written one of these myself, I know that you have very tight constraints in you, and, uh, and, so, they're, and so he's trying to cover the, the major part and also cover something that isn't usually covered. And so I think he left that on the cutting floor, uh, on the cutting room floor. Um, Meanwhile, in the 1980s, it was discovered that some ribonucleic acids, or RNAs, have enzymatic activities. This discovery pivoted chemical evolutionary thinking towards the suggestion that life on Earth began in an RNA world because the proteins were too hard to form. Uh, there's only been one successful experiment making proteins, um, and that has uh, such an artificiality about it that it really hasn't convinced uh, too many people. Um, and uh, this concept was reinforced when it was found that ribosomes, where proteins are made in the cell, are in fact ribozymes. That is, the ribonucleic acid actually catalyzes part of the reaction, namely the linkage formation between amino acids. So I thought maybe they can do a bunch of other stuff. Experiments uh, and experimentation, however, revealed the near impossibility of the routine formation in a primordial setting of nucleotides, which is a point that the RNA world misses. If you don't have the raw material, you can't make a bunch of uh, ribonucleic acid. Um, 
One of the current concepts under investigation is that preceding the RNA world, there was a simpler genetic system in play, perhaps composed of self-replicating clay. And if you're going, what? Um, you have a right to do that. Uh, the concept is that you have clay that has uh, silicate sites, aluminum sites, and then other ion sites. And that somehow the other ion sites match each other in certain ways. And so some clay will stick together better than others um, and therefore will form lumps that will stay together rather than wash down the stream. Um, what this has to do with life or with clay gradually improving its clinginess or whatever and then starting to match against organic molecules. Um, it, it's an interesting speculation, but I've never seen anything that put much more than that kind of uh, talking point uh, uh, bones out. I've never seen any meat on those bones. Um, and uh, these poly these um, clays then attracted amino acids and nucleobases and uh, then they invented the RNA. So the RNA is actually a second or third step along this process. Once uh, self-replicating RNA molecules formed, they then invented proteins, which in turn invented deoxyribonucleic acids, the modern genetic material. And if you're starting to think invented, um, these things are not supposed to have minds or anything. Uh, and I think you're correct in your implicit criticism of the, uh, of the uh, scenario. Darwinian selection created and preserved biologically useful polymers. Start out with clay, then proteins, amino acids, then RNA, then um, RNA and protein, then DNA and RNA and protein. And this is how the first living cells came into existence. This narrative assigns the invention and production of the thousands of molecular machines necessary for living matter to a hypothetical self-replicating system capable of mutation. Because they need that, they, otherwise the odds are way too big and they know it. It ignores the essential fact that only living matter is capable of discriminating between useful and non-useful compounds. Given that even the first steps of this version of chemical evolution are without experimental foundation, after more than 50 years of valiant struggle in the laboratory, the entire concept of chemical evolution is on the verge of extinction. Um, the uh, conferences are getting smaller rather than larger. Although Harvard just got a grant, I think it's been five years ago, and they promised to be able to tell us how life originated in five years, so I guess we should be hearing from them fairly soon. Um, he points out that uh, we have difficulty, uh, to put it mildly, restoring dead cells to life. In the course of my laboratory work, uh, Dr. Yavor, with Estrichia coli, I treated liquid cultures with toluene, a substance which dissolves the lipids of the outer and inner membranes of E. coli, killing them. We now know the chemical composition of E. coli as well as the exact sequence of its 4.6 million uh, nucleotide chromosome <coughs> and the functions of 75% of its 4,290 proteins. Yet with all this information, we are still unable to restore life to dead E. coli cells. The strange thing is that the dead cells closely resemble the live cells in cellular co chemical composition. It's just that there are some holes in the membranes of the dead cells. And he asks, what is the essence of life? And he's going to give a little bit different answer than most of what you've heard. Leaky membranes in E. coli pre prevent energy generation. In the absence of chemical energy supplied by adenosine triphosphate molecules, or ATP, biochemical pathways shut down and the cells die. Life processes depend on chemical changes. 
Isolated chemical reactions routinely reach their end point, equilibria, where as much as going forward is backward and nothing, the concentrations don't change. At, at which point chemical changes cease. Actually, technically they keep going, but they no, there's no longer a net change. This does not happen in live cells because chemical reactions are connected into pathways. The products of pathways are either utilized by the cell's met metabolism or, if they begin to accumulate, the pathways shut down through sophisticated regulatory mechanisms. Living matter requires the presence of the genetic material in thousands of specific proteins. However, these are also present in the toluene killed E. coli cells. He's making a point which is often overlooked, and that is that you take a cell and you punch holes in its membranes, the cell dies, you haven't really changed all that much. All you've done is let certain things go to equilibrium, and particularly the pH system, which prevents uh, making uh, ATP from a, from a hydrogen ion gradient. At the time of death, there is no measurable change in the complexity of E. coli. With the passage of time, the intricate cellular makeup will degrade. However, seconds after death, the sole difference between a live and a dead cell is the equilibrium state of the reactions and pathways. This irreducible complexity, uh, the irreducible complexity of living matter, so elegantly explained by Michael Behe, and this is uh, Darwin's black box, is unaltered when equilibrium sets in. Therefore, while irreducible complexity may be necessary for living matter to exist, it is insufficient to explain life. It is the non-equilibrium status of thousands of chemical reactions that keep the cell alive. Any scheme positing that living matter comes into existence piecemeal, step by step, must deal with this insurmountable problem, how to convert large numbers of chemical reactions, large numbers, not just one or two, but multiple ones, from their equilibrium states to non-equilibrium so that the cell can kind of get up and running. It's like a, a little bit like a motor that isn't turning. The famous uh, Chateliers, I think he means Lee Chateliers, if I remember correctly. Uh, that may be the editor's problem. Uh, if a chemical system at equilibrium Equal experiences a change in concentration, temperature, volume, or partial pressure, then the equilibrium shifts to counteract the imposed change. This principle ensures the impossibility of the spontaneous reversal of dead cells to life. It also nullifies any chemical evolutionary scheme on Earth as well as anywhere in the universe. Uh, his conclusion, there's only one correct answer possible to the question, where did life come from? It is not found in the review articles of scientific journals nor in biology textbooks. The answer is given by the Creator Himself, etched in stone by His fingers. For in six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Of course, quoting Exodus 20, verse 11. And then he suggests a couple of, uh, actually four, uh, books, all of which are uh, quite good reading. Uh, the first one, of course, is by him, uh, The Mystery of Life's Origin is an old uh, one, but it's still uh, worth reading, and that one ha talks about the problem of uh, an oxidizing atmosphere, which is, I guess, just re recently gotten reinforced by the finding of cerium-3 instead of cerium-2. Um, uh, triply instead of doubly charged uh, cerium, that's a, uh, an element of one of the rare earths that occasionally gets incorporated into zircons, and uh, implying that the, 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 the atmosphere when those, cer when those zircons were being formed was more oxidizing, um, and therefore oxygen was at least partly around. And which, of course, means that hydrogen and uh, methane are not likely to be around. So the Stanley Miller experiments would not be uh, actually appropriate ones to find life on Earth. Um, my own 
review of this particular chapter is that uh, Yavor, I think, makes a good case for life requiring a creator. He adds what I consider a unique insight, uh, talking about equilibrium. He leaves out some areas that would add to his case, such as the presence of oxygen when the early Precambrian rocks are forming, uh, which we've talked about. And he very briefly discusses the difficulty of forming and preserving uh, ribose nucleotides, which I think is really important. If you're going to have an RNA world, you have to have RNA first. And to get RNA, you have to have components of RNA. And they have to be in fairly substantial concentrations, and that just doesn't happen in these kinds of spark experiments. Um, he tends to use more absolute language than I'm used to. Um, uh, you can discuss whether that's appropriate or not. Um, I know that if I was writing for somebody who's a, uh, who's a doubter, I tend to avoid that because uh, you tend to sound like you uh, are making stronger statements than you can back up. I usually allow the, the data to speak for itself. Um, I think he has a very good reading list at the end. Um, uh, I'm going to leave the rest of the discussion uh, to you. <coughs> so, um, comments or questions? Uh, what? Was Bihu a chemist? Bihu is a biochemist. Yes. Got uh, one back there. I have a question. Uh, you said that for 50 years scientists have been uh, experimenting, trying to show trying to show that life is the result of non-design, the lack of design. Now, suppose that additional efforts uh, and more careful design will eventually produce some kind of life. Will that be evidence that life is the result of a lack of design? Um. In, a, in other words, I'm trying to understand what the purpose, what are they trying to prove? Because for me, if after so much effort and so much design by scientists, they succeed, to me, this will be evidence that life is the result of design instead of l a lack of design. Am I wrong? or? Uh, I, I think you're right on that. Uh uh, I, the idea, uh, as, as somebody said, if you're trying to show that nature can bake a cake, then if you throw some wheat seeds near a spring, it's kind of understandable, you know, it's kind of maybe helping nature out a little bit to see if that will help, but uh, um, then if you... Uh, then if you harvest the wheat and, and have some rocks fall on it, um, it's starting to stretch things a little bit. If you, get it, if you put it into a mill and then, uh, and then throw it into an oven, I, I think at that point you're fairly clearly giving up on unguided nature. Uh, and I would say that, you know, what really strikes me as odd is I have actually discussed this with people who would argue in all seriousness that we can't design life, therefore it couldn't be designed, therefore it must be uh, made by unguided nature. And um, to me, that's a little bit equivalent to if we were to get to um, Mars or someplace that you know we could actually land on, <coughs> and we stepped out and we found this thing that, uh, when we punched numbers into it, would do unbelievable calculations. 
And uh, <coughs> we found several of them around. So it wasn't just an accident. Um, and we started looking at the innards of it and come to find out it's a quantum computer. And we have no clue as to how to make the thing that we would say, well, that's not evidence for some kind of intelligence in Mars. That just must be, you know, a natural phenomenon because, because we can't make it. Uh, it. To me, it just does not follow. I think what's happening is that what you see is people who are so driven by their worldview, their agenda, whatever you want to call it, that they are willing to say things that are otherwise totally inexplicable, totally off the wall stupid, because they're not willing to admit that, you know, maybe there is an intelligence that's bigger than us, that uh, uh, smarter than us, that could have made us. Um, and um, um, when, I, when I see that, I mean, I've seen people who, in the course of discussion, will argue with a straight face. Well, I don't know for sure if it's a straight face, because all you can see is their keyboard, you know. But um, they will argue, in apparently all seriousness, that humans really aren't any more intelligent than chimpanzees. Uh, we don't really understand intelligence, so therefore it probably doesn't exist. That um, you know, I mean, you can argue about the nature of intelligence if you want to, but to deny intelligence has certain unavoidable negative self-referential aspects to it. Um, in other words, <laughs> to say you're not in, uh, to say there is no intelligence means that the person who's speaking is not intelligent. Um, anyway, um, I'll I'll leave that to to other uh, to other people to discuss at this point. But I just I, I'll point out to you that these people are. They're driven by their belief system. This is why Stanley Miller could say in 1974, you know, we're looking <laughs> for it and we're pretty sure we're going to find it. Even though the experiments on Earth had all gone flat. It isn't because of the experiments. It's because they know the history of Earth and they know there wasn't a God. So it must have happened somehow. And it must have happened without any special intervention. And so therefore, it must happen everywhere that it could happen. It's really a, it's a theoretical deduction in the face of experimental evidence. I'm going to set up and give. Um, Ariel and uh, uh, um, Leonard and, and, and Sean, go ahead. Um, I don't know of any reputable university that has ever given a degree to a chimpanzee. And hence the uh, effort at times to say, well, chimpanzees are almost human uh, seems a little bit out of kilter, nor do I know of any pet that has received a kindergarten certificate. I mean, these analogies aren't that great. But what I was going to uh, mention is uh, uh, I don't, f having uh, you know written one of these chapters, I know the constraints of space and so on that you put into. <clears throat> but this uh, RNA world argument seems to be getting an awful lot of attention 
Yet it seems to me that <clears throat> you can have all the RNA you want there. This is not, this is just a minor issue. It, and uh, just because you think you've got an RNA world and you've got a RNA <clears throat> produced DNA and all the, the, the pattern he went through there. Uh, this is not really to me the, the big issue. The big issue is where are you going to get all this information that you need for life? You have all the RNA you want to. You're not going to have the information to make the proteins, the DNA, and all this. And the, I mean, the, well, you probably need at least several hundred enzymes uh, at best for the simplest life you can think of, and so on. Uh, where's this going to come from? Uh, to me, that's that's the real argument, and uh, we're going to not forget that one. While we get caught sometimes in these these other uh, things per se. Uh, I could say more about the uh, science. Thing. I'll be quiet for a minute here. Leonard? I just want to expand a little bit on what, what you were saying. <clears throat> it, it often amazes me that the, how little recognition there is, or at least how little talking about, these assumptions that science works with, the naturalistic assumption, and what effect it has. Science normally will take different hypotheses and try to figure out how to test between them. Okay, how much do we see that happening in discussing the origin of life, you know, whether or not, to, to really try to test whether or not it requires a designer or whether it doesn't. Now, the, the ID people do that, but not, but not their, their critics. Um, and, and the fact is that their critics have no choice. They have no choice. They, they've chosen the naturalistic assumption which denies the possibility of actually trying to test between design or, or not design. And, and I find trouble seeing that as science. And now some philosophers of science will, will openly recognize that science, as it's done now, is a, basically a game. You, you, you have these rules. You will not consider the possibility of miracles. And you see how far you can go with that. But if, if that's really the way, s if that's recognized, then why would intelligent people, uh, you know, run down those who do consider design. If, okay, you're, here's your game, here's my game, let, let's see which one works, you know, but it, um, and that may sound, you know, when I say that they have no choice, that may sound like too strong language, but it comes from them, not from me. That they deny the, ch the idea that you would, that you would recognize the possibility of a creator. And, and this dominates science not only in origin of life, but in many other areas, uh, including geology. Um, but how much recognition is, is there, even of, of among Christians? There, uh, unfortunately, not very much. I would have to agree. Sean? To play devil's advocate, I guess, a little bit, is that the reason I think that intelligent people go down that road and choose to self-inflict you know, that paradigm on themselves is because of the supposed success of uh, Darwinian evolution. The concept of evolution has, in many people's minds, uh, provided um, so many evidences uh, of support uh, for naturalistic processes and the creative abilities of mindless nature uh, on all, all kinds of different levels that it's fairly rational to assume that it goes down deeper uh, even still, deeper than we can see um, happening in real life. And we can see certain things that nature can do. Natural selection is a real force of nature. It's also mindless, evidently, as far as we can tell. And it does produce amazing changes in the natural world. And so it's rational to assume that if you go down farther, you're going to find the same effects farther down the scale. The problem is, though, when you completely turn your mind off to testing that assumption, and which is what I think Leonard Brand points out, that if you stop testing your assumptions with alternatives, it's no longer science, it's strictly philosophy at that point. Go ahead. Uh, wh what do you think the odds of scientists discovering um, a self-replicating molecule at some vent under the ocean? And what would be the implications if that were to happen? But, but first, what's the, what's the, the odds? Well, the odds are extremely uh, uh, rare. Even if uh, even if such a molecule could exist, the problem is getting to the right vent at the right time. Um, 
events are not easy to access. So that uh, for practical purposes, the odds are zero. I mean, at a certain point, there's not much point in investing that kind of uh, effort and time to, to go down and look at them. And right now, people are looking at vents for totally different purposes, and, and, and some of them will look to see if there's anything there. But I mean, if you were to try to test a self-replicating molecule, there'd be two problems with it. Number one is, how would you recognize it? And the, the second problem is, how would you know that it didn't come from some living organism that started there to begin with? And so between the two of them, I don't think there's any really strong active research hunting for those molecules. Um, there are all kinds of interesting pipe dreams out there. Uh, zinc sulfide and ultraviolet light is supposed to uh, interact to form uh, uh, to be able to join some organic compounds together. Um, the evidence is pretty slim. Well, the problem with self-replicating RNA is that there, it, it isn't actually there. Um, there is RNA that will reproduce maybe four or five, um, uh, at least the, the, the literature that I've read, uh, four or five uh, bases to maybe half a dozen, in, in, but it's it's not like it reproduces the whole 180. Uh, and so at this point, at this point, what we're living with is actually people who say, well, we've demonstrated they could do four or five. Maybe it could do 180. And uh, let's just put it this way. You, you wouldn't want to use that as an uh, argument uh, at a uh, stockholders meeting. Or you'd, you'd, you'd find yourself on the wrong end of a lawsuit really, really quick. Um, let's see this yeah, here. Yeah, natural, na you mentioned natural selection. It happens only at phenotype, never, ever in genotype. Yeah, right. But the genotype never changes. It's, uh, well, the, you cannot, the, no the problem selection. with the genotype is that most of the effects that we see are actually, actually degenerations. Right. Uh, for example, and the right. best example I can give right now is that, is that if you go to the Arctic, the bears are white, the foxes are white, the birds are white, the rabbits are white. Well, guess what? That's all loss of pigmentation. Right. And so you do see loss of function. It's very, very hard to get gain of function. The, the best illustration I have seen in the literature where it was actually demonstrated in the laboratory was a four amino acid um, gain that, uh, or no, correction, four base, uh, RNA base gain in an RNA virus. And the amount of selective pressure that had to be put on this was of the order of 10 to the zero, basically zero. Uh, to uh, 10 to the 17th as reproducive, reproduce, reproductive power. So in other words, it took basically uh, way more, I mean, most of us reproduce at, at somewhere between t uh, 10 to the uh, 0 and 10 to the 1. I guess Bach had 22, so he did 10 to the 1.3 or so. Um, but, uh, but most of us uh, don't have near that many children. Um, yeah, well, uh, what I'm saying is that four bases is not very much. Uh, so you can, get, you can get some increase in information. <coughs> it's just, it's really hard. It takes a lot of... Uh, a, a lot of selective power to make it come out. 
Um, and granted, if you extended that over a few thousands of years, you could, you could maybe get a little more. If you extend it over a few million years, maybe you could get a little more. But you're, you're still talking about um, gains of very small. And they're gains in the face of continual breakdown of information, uh, which I think is one of the arguments that, uh, that uh, what's his name, uh, Sanford makes and I think makes well. Uh, got a comment over here, and uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a lay observation on <coughs> the discussion today. It seems like uh, the gap between life and non-life in discussing origins is an impenetrable barrier. It's kind of like a black hole. Can you go into the black hole and come back out and survive intact? It, you know, it looks totally impossible. <coughs> and to me, Darwinism as an ism, a total worldview and philosophy, uh, collapses. Uh, it self-integrates with this topic perhaps more than any other topic. <coughs> and as Sean mentioned there, when you're looking at recent diversification of life and some processes today, yes, you can extrapolate backwards, but you only can go back so far. So that's kind of my lay observation of this important topic. Now, Dr. Plata mentioned uh, self-replication. <coughs> A virus, right, uh, can self-replicate. The question is whether it's life. I had a first-hand encounter with multitudes of viruses earlier this week with the stomach flu, so that's why I'm bringing it up. But uh, there, there are certain qualifications of what is life. One is to have a uh, cell wall, if you're talking about cellular life, uh -huh. and to protect it from the environment and so on. And that's right. Well, uh, virus, so I wanted some viruses, comments from the, the those who are medical people and scientists here. The problem with viruses as a standalone organism is that they don't really stand alone. There are parasites on oh. other organisms, and if you don't have yeah. the other organisms, they don't multiply. Period. And that needs to be made clear to lay people, even myself, on what is life. I think we could do a better job <coughs> defining. <coughs> and sometimes uh, the origin of life is tied in with what viruses might be able to do, right? Well, the problem is, again, viruses don't do anything no. until you put them in the appropriate media. Good. And the media has to be so close to living cells that the virus can't tell the difference. And yeah. uh, I, I mean, I read one interesting experiment so it, where they were doing a Kornberg uh, virus where they were trying to show that the RNA could replicate on its own. And they made uh, RNA with, um, they tagged it with bromine somehow. I think it was five bromouracil, mm. uh, and uh, and so they 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 made this virus, which because it had all this bromine mm -hmm. on it, was heavier than the rest, and you could centrifuge it out when you wanted to, and then they would uh, they would grow it, and they grew they they listed all the ingredients, and then they said they got an extract of E. coli cells that they couldn't identify. And I'm going at this point, <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm. um, what, it, what it says to me is that, it, you, know, you, know, you try to imagine that this kind of thing would happen on an early Earth. Yeah. And you go, no, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, a few E. coli cells up the road got ground up and washed into the pool along with the, the other chemicals. Uh, and, and all of them are going to require <coughs> nucleotides fully charged. You're going to have to have adenine hooked to ribose hooked to phosphate, and a bunch of phosphate, three of them at least. Um, try to imagine a natural process that's going to put this out. One of the big jobs that we have uh, as made up of cells is to make this ATP. And that's assuming that the process is just go, uh, already done. And it just, that doesn't make sense. Um, 
the RNA world requires such a specialized um, medium to grow it that <coughs> to try to imagine that there was any of that on the early Earth just kind of blows one away. But again, if you need this, and you really need reproduction in order to have differential reproduction, in order to have evolution help decrease the unlikelihood of life originating. Uh, I mean, that's one of the things that, that's one of the real attractions of the RNA world is that if you can just get it started, maybe evolution will assist you. Because it assists everything else. Yeah. So it takes intelligence to uh, have uh, the, the right RNA conditions to get the right results. Yeah. So you're starting with intelligence. You're starting with intelligence. You're starting with intervening intelligence, massively intervening intelligence. Um, Ariel and Sean. Well, getting back to the question we were discussing a little earlier, why does the scientific community... Uh, take the stance it does in the face of such difficult problems. Uh, I think maybe we can understand a little bit of it, and I could be wrong. Uh, power is an extremely intoxicating thing. And uh, I think we've noted it in uh, what's happened in the Middle East. Uh, these dictators, they, they do everything to hang on to that power. Uh, regardless of what uh, uh, the consequences are. Uh, you can go back to Hitler, you can go back even to Solomon. And uh, uh, throughout humanity, that this has been a problem. I think it's a basic problem that every one of us faces. Uh, and we have to uh, wrestle with it. Uh, I think part of the problem is that the scientific community does not want to give up its power. A scientific community is very proud. It has reason to be proud to a certain extent because uh, science is, you know, is one of the probably most uh, uh, wonderful intellectual achievements of mankind. And so, to a certain extent, uh, scientists do have a a right to, to a certain amount of pride. But then, and we, we've sent people to the moon. We've abolished smallpox. It's, no, we, we've been, you know, it's, it's been very good to a certain extent, but we need to keep in mind that there's good science and there's bad science. And, uh, and the bad science likes to ride on the coattails of the good science. Right, and evolution rides on the coattails of the success of science. Uh, and I wonder if part of the problem here is that, you know, scientists don't want to give up their power, uh, their superiority, uh, Admitting that there's a God uh, that did all this and so on uh, is a little bit humiliating to the proud soul. Uh, and I think this may be a factor in here. And of course, we need to be all careful that we don't do the same thing as we treat our fellow men. Uh, because we, we all have this you know, ego and uh, personal pride type of... Uh, thing that we have uh, that uh, uh, we need to suppress and uh, keep under control if, if we are to be good Christians. I agree. Uh, before Sean speaks, I'll just point out that it's now a little past 11.30, and I know some of you have places you need to go. Um. Just one quick thing on viruses. I think viruses are also designed as are even subcellular machines. They all require an extreme amount of information to order them properly. And uh, just because it's not what matches some people's definition of a living thing doesn't mean it wasn't designed or doesn't require design elements to it. So I think viruses are designed um, yeah. or, or devolved from other living things. I mean, uh, what makes a uh, what makes a caterpillar a beautiful butterfly? Uh, there are certain genes it has. It's uh, certain genes are suppressed, and other mm -hmm. genes are activated, and, and things change. Um, you take a fish, put it in the uh, deep water where there's no light in time. It's going to lose its eyesight. 
it has nothing to do with internal uh, big changes. It's just the genes are suppressed, so it loses its eyesight. It's it has been. Genes are suppressed and implicitly their eyesight by mutation. Yeah, right. Mutation is okay. But that doesn't. Yeah, there you are. So selection, selective loss. Right, selective loss. Uh, where has there been selective gains? Only on a limited scale. Very limited scale. You see, uh, just another experiment just came to my mind. I want to share. Someone in Minnesota took uh, um, saltwater fish and freshwater fish. They put it in one tank and put a barrier in between. Over seven and a half years, he was adding a little bit of salt in one side and uh, put it to, um, what is it, 3.6, I think, percent uh, salt in the salt water. Yeah, in in a matter of seven and a half years, took over the barrier, and they were all lived together in peace for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the adaptation is there um, all over the world, but it does mm -hmm. not prove that it's. Uh, uh, it proves that the designer is there, and he loves beauty and variation. Yeah, yeah, I would have to agree. Oh boy, we have comments all over. Uh, let's uh, yeah. go back here and then here and Just then up to. Another comment on today's discussion. I think the uh, quest for the origin of life is nicely described. When you start eliminating all the possibilities, I think that's a brilliant part of this presentation. You know, they they've gone down into the deep sea, looking at these smokers and you know, looking for the hypothermal vents, it's called. Mm -hmm. They can't come up with origin of life there. They've gone to the moon. As you mentioned, they've gone to Mars. And by the way, Peter Hare, who once was a member of this community in retirement, was part of the Viking probe, and he actually tested s Martian samples in his lab, as I understand it, looking for life. And anyway, uh, you can keep going beyond our solar system maybe next time bring in the exoplanet search. The whole idea of finding exoplanets that are just right for life. That's what the news media. And it shows that scientists think this is their l perhaps last resort, finding life on some exoplanet. But then how do you get it back to Earth with all the al ultraviolet radiation and so on? It's, again, an impenetrable barrier, as I mentioned earlier. Well, what I see is there's, there's a philosophical thing that's going on here, and it says nature is run by laws most of the time. Yeah. Let's, by hypothesis, say that nature is run by laws all of the time. And those laws don't take into account the mental processes of, uh, of intelligent beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, there must have been a time before any intelligent beings and so therefore, there had to be non-life, and then there had to be life afterwards. Mm -hmm. And if there were no intelligent beings to assist it, then it had to happen without intelligence. So then the question reduces to how. Right. Not whether. Exactly. And when you realize that, you realize that these, play, these people are playing with a, a, a stacked deck. And it's, you know, it's not going to work. No, nope. impossible. Um, yes? Uh, I had a question on um, those that believe in uh, theistic evolution, kind of back to more the beginning of what you were talking about today. At what point do they see an intervention or, or the starting point for um, God's work on that, but then is leaving it alone and letting supposed evolution take over from there. What's, what's the differentiation in that uh, between, that, that in-between space that theistic evolution has to fall in? Where did the, where's their cutoff point? Theistic evolution is a strange bird. It is not, it is driven by two major problems. Uh, one, people who don't want a world without God. Um, for various reasons, some of them having to do with um, the, the reality of good and evil. And it's awfully hard to get good and evil to mean anything if, um, if you don't have a God. 
you can say, well, it's suffering, but then is it everybody's suffering or just mine? Um, and uh, if it's just mine, then of course that leads to very uh, egocentric uh, position, which I think most people instinctively know is not really fulfilling. Um, but at the same time that they have this desire to have God, they have this, but science can explain everything. And so they're trying to have both at the same time. That's what it boils down to. And it's a very difficult exercise. I happen to think that it's probably doomed to failure. Um, and part of it is because there is no coherence. Uh, I mean, if you take science the way scientists want you to take it, or at least the majority of scientists, if you define science as a majority rule, and you just go with that, then they don't want God anywhere near anything. So if you're going to do your theology based on that, you're just going to have to give up on God. But if you don't want to do that entirely, what these people usually do is they argue for good and evil proves the existence of God. And the other one that they all argue is that the universe creation itself argues for the existence of God. And what it boils down to is that they use the same God of the gaps argument everybody else does. Why? Because there is no other kind of argument. Any entity is known by the effects it has. And that can't be accounted for on the basis of something else. That's how I know you're here. Because when I look at you, I don't see a chair. I see something else. You see? Um, and that's how, that's how we detect anything. And one of these days, we'll figure out that this God of the gaps thing has to be met head on. And the best way to meet that is to say, I, at least in my opinion, the best way to meet the God of the gaps argument is to say, look, it's not just the kind of gaps, although that's true too, that if you invoke God for little ones, it's not as impressive. Um, but it is also the fact that assuming there is a God actually helps your predictive power. And, and when we realize that and we start to do that more, which is one of the reasons why I'm really happy about Leonard Brand writing up his stuff, about how his research has been helped by thinking about God. That's probably more powerful than anything else we can do. It, for myself, the single best scientific argument I can give for God is the ability to say, this is what we should find in radiocarbon dating and in going out and finding it. And finding it when nobody else expected it, but finding it in a way that nobody else can really get, discount it. Um, and that's, uh, and you know, the interesting thing is that that's something a layman can do. Layman can say, I don't know about biochemistry. I don't know about biology and molecular biology and, and paleontology and all that stuff. But what I do know is that I asked God into my life and he made a difference. And you can argue till you're blue in the face that that wasn't really God, that was just some kind of psychological thing. Go ahead and argue. It doesn't convince me who's inside of that experience. And I think one of the things we have to do is to personalize this for non-scientists as well as for scientists. I think we make a mistake when we think that you can have salvation by PhD. And it's not only the learning that, that this is actually accessible to people with very little learning. And when people have that experience, there's very, very, very little that can shake them. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, uh, uh, I'm going to make this last comment. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, uh, before I made, uh, I asked the question. I want to support what you just said. Uh, I lived, uh, you know, was, let me illustrate this with an anecdote. You know that I'm uh, for life, human life, mm -hmm. for the protection of human life. Yes. Uh, many months ago, I tried to give a pamphlet, a pro-life pamphlet, to an Adventist lady, loving Adventist lady. She was furious. She threw it, literally, almost literally threw it into my face. And she said, don't you ever do this again to me. Well, I recently published my book, and uh, I met her again, and I was debating, should I offer her a copy of my book? Because the book's heavier than the, than the pamphlet. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and I said, I hope you won't feel offended, but I feel like I should offer you a copy of my book. She said, uh, you, you wrote the book? I said, yes. About what? I said, well, it's about abortion. She said, by all means, please give me a copy. I want to read it. And then I said, OK. I gave her a book. And then I left. And she followed me. And she says, Nick, I need to tell you something. I was not a Christian. I want to read your book, and I want to see what you have in it. So kindness sometimes prevails when if we try to impose our views on others, it doesn't work. But my question is about panspermia. You mentioned that. Suppose science can one day show evidence, strong evidence, that life came from some planet outside of our galaxy or whatever. Would that solve the problem of origin of life? It, wouldn't that be just like poli what politicians have been doing? They, they cannot agree on a budget, so they keep uh, kicking the can on the road, pushing the problem to future congressmen, future uh, uh, generations to solve. Well, uh, in, in, fact, in fact, it would. Um, because then the question would be, and where did that life come from? And in fact, if you admit that life on Earth came from someplace else, or that it came from some uh, other intelligence. In the universe's case, you can only kick the can for about 13.7 billion years. Actually, more like 13.5, because the first uh, uh, probably 200 million years, it was too hot to have anything actually working. Uh, and then you quit. And so you're either going to have to have life start somewhere. Uh, you don't have infinity. If you had infinity, then the arguments that we could say anything that could happen did happen, and therefore we're here, and therefore just shut up and live with it. But that's not the picture that the, that they, uh, of the universe that we have at this time. It was either carefully designed, in which case you've already got designed, and why, why fight this for life, or else it was, uh, it was created in a uh, massive, uh, something that would be roughly the equivalent of a fireball, only far hotter and, and uh, more, less organized, although incredibly smooth. And so you can't go beyond 13.7 billion years. You're just stuck. 
And um, and and you're right. If it if it came from someplace else, uh, then you're just assuming that they evolved out, out there. Now, one one slight advantage of doing that would be maybe it evolved on a planet that had more um, more hydrogen and, and less oxygen than the early Earth did. So maybe that would be one way of getting around that particular problem. But you still got all the other problems that. It, if you're not going to solve it here on Earth, then to imagine that you solve it uh, somewhere in Alpha Centauri is is really stretching it. So uh, you're right. Um, you're right. Even panspermia really doesn't solve the problem completely. It would at least give them more time. And I think this is the thing. When you're pushed into a corner. You're looking for any kind of escape you can find, and you'll take escapes that aren't really escapes because you think maybe if you keep digging, there'll be escapes there. That's really what's driving the, um, the RNA world. That's really what drove before it the uh, protein world. Um, people looking desperately for some kind of answer that wouldn't involve design. And in fact, they wouldn't involve superhuman design. Because at that time, and even today, we're not capable of designing living cells. We can replace the DNA in a cell, but we still can't take that DNA and lay it on the table and have it create life. It has to be put into an already functioning cell. And that's, that's just the way it is. Um, all the evidence, and I can say with confidence, all the evidence points towards a designer of life that is smarter than we are, which means there's somebody out there, and they know more than we do, and they could get their products to Earth, so they're around. Now, that's scary if you don't know that the somebody who's out there has your best interest at heart. Uh, I agree with you. That reminds me of the Jews during when Jesus was on this earth. He was God himself on earth. With all the arguments possible you could possibly imagine to convince the Jews that he was the Messiah. And he used all the arguments, all the evidence, miraculous event, bringing people back to life. Didn't and matter. did he succeed? Well, he succeeded with a few. But I mean, the Jewish, those that were opposing him, they would not budge. And finally, they said, he's doing this with the power of Beelzebub. But they would not admit that he was the son of God, the Messiah because it had certain kinds of implications that they weren't willing to go for. Power. They had the power. Well, <laughs> it's not just power. There's other things, too. It, it has to do with uh, where you want to go philosophically. But, but it's, uh, this is one of the cases that really we have a slam dunk. And the people, who are, the people who are opposing are fighting against the evidence. And I think once that's pointed out, um, that at least people who are trying to be fair will recognize it. 